Welcome lads and lasses to the Roker Report Extra Podcast. Today we're bringing you a historical based pod detailing the exploits of Edwardian era Sunderland goalkeeper Lee Richmond Roos. Roos, a proud Welshman, played for the lads 92 times between 1908 and 1910, helping the club to finish second in the league on two occasions. Roos wowed the Roker Park faithful with his elaborate Manuel Neuer-esque style of goalkeeping. I'm your host James Copley and I'm joined by Sunderland AFC historian and author Paul Days. How are you doing Paul? I'm doing very well, thanks. Nice, nice to, to be here. Yep. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, I'm also joined today by journalist, broadcaster and author of Lee Roos's biography, Spencer. It's Vignes, isn't it? It is Vignes. Vignes, I yes, thought it was. It How is. are you, Spencer? Thanks I'm for making the trip absolutely, up. I'm, yeah, I'm fine and dandy, thank you very much. Where have you come from today? Oh, York via, well, Cardiff via York. Cardiff via York. Yes, home is Cardiff, but yep. I used to work up in the northeast quite a bit, uh, covering Sunderland for the for the Observer. Some people may remember a few years ago, before I got ruthlessly cut in a budget, <laughs> another round of budget cuts. But it's good to be back up here anyway, even if it is January and bit chilly, isn't it? Cold. Yes. And Paul, you've authored many books on Sunderland AFC. What was your most recent one? Uh, well, the most recent one was the one looking at the. Uh, some of the FC is the world champions, unbelievably, given the current circumstance in 1894-95. <laughs> and just before that, I did a two-volume series on the founding fathers of Sunderland FC, looking at the founding date and whatnot in the mm. first decade of what you might term pre-league football for Sunderland. And you also run the website Rye Hill Football? I do. Rye Hill Football, yes. There's a story as to why it's Rye Hill, but I'll not go into that. <laughs> There's some, I would encourage you all to go to ryehill.co.uk or ryehillfootball.co.uk. Some brilliant articles on there and some um, some very good prints as well. I've got some here today. I'll be posting them on Twitter um, so you can get your hands on them there. Right, into Lee Roos, who was a Playboy of the era before there was Playboys in the uh, Edwardian period where it was conservative to say the least. So he, he stood out, didn't he, Spencer? He did stand out back then. He was a prototype in, in many ways. He was the prototype goalkeeper, the prototype player. Playboy, um, particularly when it came to football, he was also an amateur. He never turned professional, and this was at a time in you know in, in football where the, the powers that be wanted players to turn professional because they thought it improved you know the image of the game and everything like that. And Lee realised quite early on that actually he was far better off remaining uh, an amateur because he play. used to uh, he used to fiddle some of his expenses, didn't he? Well, they, yeah, he <laughs> did basically he played for what was known as boot money, really, uh, or a percentage of the gate. And he realised quite early on that he was better off. Paying for or playing for, you know, a percentage of the of the the attendance money rather than turning professional and you know paying for a set amount. So uh, yeah, he was able to um, have his sidelines along with playing football, basically, which mm. included um, uh, writing as a as a kind of uh, a professional footballer writing about the game back then in that era which was unknown. I mean, we all know about, you know, ghosted columns now from professionals and things who, mm-hmm. who get nice, tidy amounts of money for, you know, their, their, their thoughts about the game. But Lee was the first one um, who ever used to do anything like that. He was also that rarest of things because he was, uh, he was a middle-class man playing a working-class game. He was a, a graduate. From Attended Aberystwyth University. University. University, yeah. So, you know, he, he knew his way around uh, a pen, shall we say, mm-hmm. basically, and, and, and you know, a, an addictionary. He, so, yeah. He was, before he turned professionally, he was going to study medicine. I yeah, that was the plan. His, mm-hmm. his, his dad was a Presbyterian church minister and, mm-hmm. and, and wanted a good profession for his son. And uh, I think he decided he wanted to go off and study uh, medicine. He went to Aberystwyth and studied bacteriology. Wow which is examining little minute things. Which b- back in those days, I imagine, was quite the cutting edge I, of, of from, technology. Yeah, that was the plan. He moved from Aberystwyth down to London uh, to basically go and, and work in the hospitals and do his mm-hmm. degree course. But his goalkeeping got in the way. And he joined originally, He joined when he first moved to London, he joined London Welsh, mm-hmm. which then, you know, it, it was a, we know it as a rugby club now, but back yeah. then they also had a football team. And he did so well while he was in London, just, you know, during his months playing for London Welsh, that basically, um, you know, it was a matter of time before one of the, the clubs, you know, uh, you know, top flight clubs came in for him. And that first club was Stoke. So that was the first club he went to. So, and, and what what made Lee stand apart from the rest of the, the goalkeepers in the era was his playing style, wasn't it? Well, I think, yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, goalkeepers... Um, Back in those days, were were very much almost like cannon fodder. Yeah, you know they were there, you know, pretty much to stand on the line. You stayed rooted to the line, and you tried to save whatever was thrown at you. And centre forwards, you know, used to play. They 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 developed this style of play known as rushing, which was basically, say, for instance, uh, I'm the goalkeeper. 
and you two guys, Paul, you know, and you, James, you're the centre forwards. So Paul used to rush in and knock me over, <laughs> hoping that I would spill the ball, and James, you would then come in and knock the ball into an empty net. And of course, this is a tactic that actually ended up killing one of yeah. Sunderland's goalkeepers, Jimmy Thorpe, yeah. in 1935? 36, yes, that's against Chelsea. So this is an era where you know goalkeepers yeah, it, didn't have any sort no. of protection like they do today. And, and Lee's attitude was basically, well, if centre-forwards are allowed to do this to goalkeepers, then... I'm going to do it back to centre forward. So he fought fire with fire. You know, he would come racing off his line and try and, you know, hack the ball clear or clatter somebody to the ground and do anything that he could to uh, to get his hands on the ball. And of course, back then, um, up until 1912, goalkeepers were actually free to handle the ball anywhere inside their half of the, the field of play. If they, if they were bouncing it, wasn't it? Yeah, if they were yeah. bouncing it. The idea was you got hold of the uh, got a hold of the ball in your penalty area and then like a basketball player, you could walk or run mm -hmm. up the field to the halfway line before releasing the ball, kicking I it off. I have, I have the, the Association Football rule for goalkeepers here. It was <laughs> Law 8 back in the day stated that the goalkeeper may, within his own half of the field of play, use his hands but shall not carry the ball. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's, it's <laughs> funny in, to think how much the game's parameters have changed. And in, the, yeah, in theory, very few goalkeepers used to do that for fear of being made to look a complete idiot, basically. You know, there you'd this, be... this is the Edwardian era of conservative, yeah. isn't it? You know, the, yeah. the, it's... But also, you imagine if you're bouncing the ball upfield and the centre yeah. forward comes in, pinches it off you and runs the ball deal. into an empty net. You know, you'd look a bit of a burk, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. But Lee used to do it as, as much as, as he possibly could. You know, if it was on and if he felt, you know, he could make more ground and do it that way, that's the way he used to do it. And the law that was introduced in 1912, pretty much banning goalkeepers from handling outside the penalty area, came about pretty much as a as a, 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 direct, consequence. a direct consequence of what Lee was doing because, in, in effect, he was the only one who did it to any real extent. Mm. And because he was a bit of a renegade and a bit of a, you know, he, he challenged authority whenever he could, he was never one for the Blazers at the FA. No. And because no. of that, you know, he didn't cooperate with any of their investigations into his expenses and things. And, we'll, and because we'll touch on the expenses. Yeah, really. definitely. But because of that, you know, the FA said, well, you know, we're going to have a last laugh. And basically, you know, they stopped him from doing it. But by then, he was... He was coming to the end of his career mm. anyway. Uh, so he, he would also, just to give you an idea of the, the kind of psyche of, of Lee Roos, he would turn his back um, on play to tell jokes to the fans. He yeah. would perform gymnastics from the goal crossbar while yeah. the ball was at the other end of the field. Yeah. I mean, these trades weren't in keeping with the kind of Victorian ideals of gentlemen. No, you, you kind of there. walked very staidly onto, yeah. the, Corinthian onto the field ideals, of play. Yeah. And, and Lee used to, he'd come out and he would run. He'd run to the middle of the pitch, or you know, and and applaud the you know the, mm. the the three or four sides of the ground, yeah, you know, which just wasn't done then. Then run to his you know his, his goal and, and shake a few hands and uh, maybe you know throw fruit into the crowd or something <laughs> like this or whatever or yeah tell jokes and yeah. Paul, I'll bring you in because I'm I'm uh, I'm sure you've done much research on uh, on Lee Roos yourself. Ah uh, yes, it, 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 it's just come back to the Corinthian uh, thing. Of course, there was the Corinthians team themselves, and it, it was always I reckoned. I'm not sure if it was ever proven, but uh, read that if they got a penalty, they would deliberately miss it. I think that is historical accuracy. Yeah, because they said that it wasn't in keeping with the spirit of the game to yeah. award a penalty. It wasn't very gentlemanly or sporting. Or whatever. It's not just true. Like the opposite. Still, uh, it's still a great story. But, even uh, if it's not true, is it? Uh, that's right. But but. But Roos himself, yeah, I mean, he arrived at Sunderland at a time where the Sunderland fans were kind of craving a replacement for Ned Doig, mm -hmm. who'd left for Liverpool in 1904. And they would had one or two keepers in between and we ended up with a lad called Bob Ward, who was in goal for us. But they, they never quite kind of hit the mark. And as Sunderland were at the time, they were always interested in the best players. Uh Clearly, he arrived in the. I think it was the January. He made his debut against Preston North End. I think it was at uh, in the January of nineteen hundred and eight. And big things were expected of him. And uh, I don't don't think he disappointed. And of course, by the December of nineteen hundred and eight, he'd contributed to one of the greatest results, not only in Sunderland's history, but in the history of uh, what was then the Football League with the 9-1 thrashing of uh, of Newcastle United, uh, for which I'd just been talking to Spencer before and asking about this. Uh, Sunderland fans might not know that uh, Roos actually ended up with a... Spencer was just saying at the end of the game, he ended up with a match ball in his hand. I didn't know that, but I knew that he'd walked up for the match ball and uh, 
of course, this was a game where George Hulley and Billy Hogg had scored hat tricks. And again, we were just talking before as to whether or not he actually gave the ball to the mat, the hat trick winner in those mm. days. He probably didn't. So Roos walks off with the match ball, the nine one, gives it to his nephew, and of course. Wouldn't it be great if we found that ball again? Could you imagine a, a it? Plea for help, isn't it? If we could, if we could find that match could ball. Just I don't think we're ever going to find that match ball because uh, you know while re- rehearsing for the for my book about Lee, you know, I, d- I did my my utmost to try and track that down, looking mm. in lofts and things and all boxes and then now it was there in the 1920s. It was still around the 30s, 40s, but after World War Two, when Lee's uh, family you know, moved house. It seems to have gone mm. gone missing in one of those moves, but hey, wouldn't it be great if it could turn up? Yeah, it, it would be uh, very good. It, it would have, but he was, uh, I mean, he was. Uh, there was a quote by George Holly, who was the mag slayer extraordinaire, uh, said Roos was the mould from which all of the goalkeepers were created. That's right, yeah. Uh, mm. And uh, Holly, Spencer just saying, was a, was a, was a big friend to... Uh, to Roos afterwards but of course Sunderland at the time was starting to build a really good side Bob Kyle had been there of course he was still the manager and he would go on to manage Sunderland seven, eight hundred times or whatever uh, perhaps our greatest manager ever and so he was starting to build a really good side at Sunderland and of course just four or five years later the, they almost won the double mm. they won the league championship and I just say it's a shame that Roos hadn't, hadn't hung about but uh, as was pointed out, he'd uh, he'd broken his arm, and me, me and Spencer were talking um, on the metro before before we reached the studio today. That Spencer he, he turned around and he said to me, "What is it with Sunderland London goalkeepers? We always <laughs> seem to have good goalkeepers." We were talking about Jimmy Montgomery, and yeah. and Roos is kind of the second in that line from Doig, isn't he? Well, y- y- you raise a really good point here because I know the the Newcastle fans always go on about the famous centre forwards. Mm. For Sunderland, they, they always have had a fascination with the goalkeepers. Yeah. It's the one position that everybody seems to remember. <laughs> and if you're not very good, you're, you're, you're remembered for a long time as not being very good. But of course, Doig had played for the club for 400 and odd times. And in fact, if you're taking the friendlies that he played as well, it was uh, it was round about 500 times in Montgomery, of course. And, and after we had Butler who played for Sunderland in the almost double win inside. Joe Butler was a really good goalie as well. But yes, I think it's a, a fair thing to say that Sunderland's always, uh, Sunderland fans have always had a little bit of a fascination with the goalkeepers and it's uh, hardly surprising that one has our appearance record. That's, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and before Roos joined Sunderland, he had a bit of a brush with, with the club. Um, his Stoke City <laughs> side came up to Broker Park and they lost 1-0. Um, and the players were enjoying a kind of post-match meal. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly where this took place. I think it was in some kind of building adjoining Roker Park. Oh, right, okay. Um, or, you know, in a, in a side room or something. Uh, Paul might know. Um, it was, But basically what happened is that uh, um, the match had been played and the two teams were sitting down and, uh, and having a post-match uh, drink and, and a meal. And there was, from what I can gather, there was um, uh, a, a guest of one of Sunderland's directors. Was uh, he, he'd had a few sherries, should we just say, mm-hmm. and um, started kind of lobbing insults in the direction of the um, the, St- uh, the Stoke team, which of course at that time Lee was playing for. And apparently, the the um, the insult that broke the camel's back was when he called the Stoke team ten cads and a goalkeeper, <laughs> which in itself is not a wonderfully Edwardian, you know, ten cads and a goalkeeper. Very, very much. So. At which point. The goalkeeper in question put down his knife and fork, got up, crossed through, and chinned him. And, and was banned by the football yeah, association for fourteen like, days. Yeah, they did. They almost. It was. I think the fourteen or fifteen days. But basically, they there was no precedent for anything like mm-hmm. that. I mean, I mean, lots, lots, lots of lots of us will um, uh, will remember Eric Cantona doing a similar thing at, at, at you know Selhurst Park. Yeah, yeah. Nineteen ninety four. I think that was ninety four, ninety five. Um, but I mean, back then, you know, there was no precedent for it, and the FA almost didn't know what to do or how to react. So basically, it was just well, a fifteen-day fine. It, it, it's interesting with the hotels. Just a little bit of uh, just a little bit of sight from Bruce, although it's still in keeping with the story. Uh, right from the the formation of Sunderland Football Club, there is, if you read the the reports and the Echo, the Sunderland Daily Echo and Shipping Gazette, as it was called at the time, <laughs> that became the Daily uh, the Sunderland Echo, and there's quite often reports of the uh, opposition teams staying over in Sunderland and going to one of three or four different hotels in the then town, and they would sit and they would tell you what they had a meat plate or something like that, <laughs> and the chairman of whoever it was would 
propose a toast to Sunderland Football Club and <laughs> wish them all the, and all this sort of thing. So that wasn't out of keeping with the the times. I assume you mm. know there wasn't the airplanes to go on and they didn't all have to get back yeah. straight away. And yeah. There was yeah. probably only three trains a day or whatever, so they, they were going to stay overnight anyway. Mm -hmm. So they had a bit of camaraderie in the all. And I, I and tell you what, Lee, Lee had another reason days. why why he used to like staying overnight. I mean, throughout his his career, he always lived in London. Mm -hmm. He kept his uh, flat in London yeah. and he travelled by train to wherever his team at the moment were, were playing. You know, so if Sunderland were at Everton, he'd go to Everton. If Sunderland were at home, he'd come up by train from King's Cross. And he'd quite often come up on a Friday night so that he could spend Friday night with uh, an admirer, shall we say. Yes, because he, he had he this was, uh, playboy image. He was and, dubbed by the Daily Mail as London's most eligible bachelor. Yeah, yeah. So um, when he did turn up, you know, there would be, you know, you, you still see it now today. You know, there's uh, certain people hang around after matches hoping to kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, grab the eye of a professional footballer. Lee used to have that, and quite often he would meet up, you know, and have a bit of a, a liaison with a, a, a fan, shall we say, on the Friday night, and quite often he'd stay over the Saturday night, go back on the Sunday as well. And, of course, all of this would be uh, on the football club's tab. Yes, so, you yes. know, it'd be fine wines to deliver to the to the room, you know, the, the room, all on the club's bill, basically. But I think he was pretty much worth it, really. He, he, he had a... He clearly had a personality somewhat. Um, the, the Football Association requested that Roos submit a list of his expenses for the 1907-08 season. Um, and Roos listed his expenses as a pistol to ward off the opposition, yeah. um, along with a coat and gloves to keep warm when not occupied, yeah. and using the toilet in brackets twice. Using the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so so he, he... You can see why the, you know, why the FA, why they, you know... The Blazers didn't particularly like him. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Uh, th th what's interesting with uh, it, it happened with Sunderland as well. You it talked about the most recent book I'd written. Of course, one of the stories that Spencer might tell us about is that his father actually knew H. G. Wells. Yeah, I've, I've read that in, on Rye Hill. Un unbelievable. That, well, you Lee, know? Lee actually knew H. G. Wells across the road from where he um, he grew up in the little village of Holt in North Wales, near right up against the the English border. Um, there was uh, a place there called the, Acad uh, Holt, uh, the Academy, Holt Academy, and H. G. Wells taught there while Lee was growing up. And as a matter of fact, Lee's brother Edward um, kicked H. G. Wells in the back while H. G. Wells was refereeing a football game between the borders um, and kicked him hard in the back and ruptured something. We're not too sure. I think that was the, the final straw for H.G. Wells teaching in Holt because he decided, you know what, I don't want to be here anymore. I, he hated football anyway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he left the school shortly afterwards. There's the, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of link in football in those days between the working class, but also the kind of upper class, if you want to get into it. I remember when I wrote the 1894 95 book, I think it was that one. I, the, Sunderland went on a, a tour down to London and they played one or two teams. It was the first time they'd ever played in London. And I think they played Corinthians and one or two others and Southampton wanted to play them, but we, we decided we couldn't make it. And Sunderland were invited to the theatre by this lady and she was a big friend of the Kings at the time, you know. Mm. And football it seemed to have this link between the, the kind of common man, mm. but also the richest of people yeah. or the most famous of people. Well, I think it was off, often the way... So, Wells and there's always been this, you know, this thing about, you know, uh, celebrities have wanted to be footballers and footballers wanted to be celebrities. Yeah. Now you could say that the two worlds have almost kind of merged. But, I mean, Lee, for one, I mean, he went out with Mari Lloyd, dated yeah, the, Mari the, Lloyd. The famous um, who, concert yeah, hall singer. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows Mari, or very few people know, know her name now, but, I mean, she was like uh, the... She was, she was kind of the equivalent to like a Vesta Tilly people might understand a bit better up here. Um, Vesta yeah. Tilly was a, f a famous one from Sullivan. Mary Lloyd was in that kind of vein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was the, the musical star of her time. Mm. So, yeah, and Lee and her dated for, for a while. So, you know. And it was controversial because she was a divorcee, I believe. She was a divorcee, she, yeah. She was, um, I think she's possibly the one one of the few people in the country who really could have, um, you know, showed Lee up for being a bit dull. Because <laughs> her life, I mean, is, is just, you know, a. a, a volumes of interesting colourful stories should we say and not mm. particularly happy end either you know she 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 died in a bit of a state and I think through alcoholism and everything um, by which time she'd long since ditched Lee and moved on and gone out with somebody else or married somebody else so mm. yeah yeah celebrity I don't know celebrities and footballers but what is the, it the other thing because one of the things to touch on I don't know if we want to is the kind of first world war 
Yes, of course. Yeah, we'll get on oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, which I don't know if it's appropriate to kind of get into that one now. But uh, yeah, far, far away. Uh, for those that don't know, Lee um, signed. He, he volunteered, didn't he? Well, when I, yeah, when war broke out, I think you know. Back then, everyone thought that the war was going to be over by Christmas. Yeah, and football, football, famously, of course, Famous. didn't cancel the sc- uh, rugby. Yeah, this is the first world war, just for anybody. Who yeah, wants first it. world yeah. war, and it's it's shameless now. You can look back and say, "What well, do you mean football didn't start?" Yeah, but of course, it was highly controversial because football was a relatively new game. It was seen as a working class game. Yeah, and rugby, well, I mean, traitors, traitors yeah, to exactly. national rugby, course, basically. rugby immediately stopped because that yeah. was the, the middle class, the upper class game. Football carried on for a little while and was it yeah. was. But Lee had, criticized for it. Yeah, Lee had stopped playing at the, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, by, by then. He, he retired in 1912. And um, in 1914, he didn't join up immediately to um, uh, to fight. He joined uh, partly, I think, because his dad was a pacifist and was a Presbyterian church minister. He thought, well, you know, he'd, he'd kind of play a part in another role. And he joined the YMCA. And he worked in... Um, in what were known as recreation centres, which after the outbreak of war were set up around uh, road junction stations, you know, where all of these soldiers were going out to France. Uh, there would be recreation centres where basically uh, soldiers could sit back and sit down and have a bit of a respite, have a cup of tea, read the papers, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Lee, of course, was 30, well, he was 30, 35, 36 when war broke out. Um, so he's quite old, really for you know for fighting then so he he did his his part in the in the ymca um to start with that's where he went out to uh gallipoli mm-hmm. he was part of the war effort out there fighting alongside the uh, men and men and women in the royal army medical corps and to, to start with when i started doing my research that's where i thought he was i thought he was working with the royal army medical corps but it turned out he wasn't he was with the ymca but then in um in 1916 you know the war was two years in uh, and after the Somme, um, you know, so many soldiers and, and young men have been cut down in their prime in the first few days of the Somme that mm. there were huge gaps in the regiments. So Sub- Sebastian Fawkes calls it a holocaust of young men. Oh, it's just incredible. And uh, at that point, Lee decides to basically join up and do some fighting. And of course, mm. the regiments were willing to take whoever they could at that point because they needed men. Mm. Uh, so Lee joined the 9th Royal Fusiliers and and went out and ended up, you know, in the in the middle of the uh, the bloodiest battle of the war. And, and his, so, goal, his goalkeeping kind of prowess helped him in the war, didn't it? Because he used to sit and lob grenades with with his good throw. At uh, one point, yeah, there was the the action. He actually won the military medal, and when for the the action that he won the mil- uh, military medal for uh, came when he carried on fighting and defending his his trench, mm-hmm. uh, even though he didn't have a gun. Uh, it was pretty much hand-to-hand combat and throwing grenades. Yeah. And, um, uh, and and when you consider he was doing that with German flamethrowers being, you know, belched through smoke at him and everything like that. I mean, uh, the the, con- the conditions of, of the First World War can't be understood. I did my dissertation on it, uh, and I remember reading an account of the first day of the Somme from a survivor, and he recalls coming to or waking up and he actually thought it was Judgment Day, he thought it was Armageddon, he, yeah. thought, he thought the world had ended. Yeah. Such was the destruction and the chaos of the scenes. Well, yeah, yeah, of course, I mean, the the, the death of Bruce, I'm sure we'll get on to in a minute, but of course for the, the Sunderland connection here, uh, Sunderland had Albert Milton, who was a full back for them, who died at, uh, at the Somme. He was with the Durham Light Infantry, I think he was with, and of course, Charlie Buchan, mm. who mm. is... I don't know, along with Carter, arguably our greatest ever players. In fact, Buchan, given who he was and his status with journalism and who he mixed with, you know, Sir Jack Hobbs and all that, in my opinion, I don't like saying it because Carter's a Hendon lad and a local lad, yeah. but Buchan was probably the biggest superstar we ever had. And Buchan was Carter's idol as well. Aye, and, and he, that, that's true. And, and, uh, and Buchan used to drink in Carter's father's pub as no, well. I didn't know that. The, ocean, right? the ocean Queen. I yeah, didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. But Buchan, of course, fought in the... The three bloodiest battles of the First World War at uh, Cambrai, Passchendaele and the Somme got the military medal. I actually spoke to his granddaughter about his war efforts because in his book, uh, he, he, he quite modestly never says anything mm-hmm. much about uh, no, about doesn't, his doesn't. war exploits. Mm-hmm. But he actually, uh, he, he was under pressure, him and his, uh, his men, and he actually uh, led a one-man assault on a German machine gun post and for his troubles, his granddaughter said he was he was bayoneted through his boot, but the bayonet went straight through his toes, 
and so it did it didn't harm him but Cambrai I think there was an account by I think it was Bismarck or something like that who was the commander of the German forces and they said uh, Cambrai was just as bad as any of the others mm -hmm. and I think Cambrai was the first battle where tanks were used in any great uh, those great huge yeah, tanks yeah. that they had was used in any great any great numbers so of course we'd have Roos we'd have Milton mm -hmm. we'd have Charlie Buchan we'd all be fighting somewhere <laughs> within close proximity. I mean, I the guess. original the, the original thing that got me onto the Lee story, slight diversion, but still to do with the war, was I was originally told, this was the first phone call that came in to me, was was I interested in writing a story about a Welsh international who played in one of these Christmas Day 1914 games. And this was in it was the early 90s you were writing this, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it would have been about 99. Mm -hmm. That was the first I'd, I'd never heard of Lee Roos before. Yeah. This phone call came in. You know, was I interested in, in, in? You know, would have I? You know, interested in doing a story about this? And yeah, damn right I was. But I went off and um, and basically, well, I was sent on a bit of a wild goose chase because it turned out that Lee hadn't been at the Western Front in 1914. He was in France, but he wasn't actually right up by the trenches, so yeah. he couldn't have played in any of these games. You know, between. The Germans and, and the English, you know, all the British famously came out of the trenches, met each other in no man's land on Christmas Day 1914 and swapped cigarettes and showed each other pictures of their families. So, But the incredible thing was in the weeks and months after that story appeared in the Western Mail newspaper, Wales's national newspaper, um, people were getting in touch with me saying, you know, did I know this about Lee? Did I know that about Lee? And the incredible thing was, was the more that came to me, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, the truth is even more incredible than the than the myth than the myth yeah which and, is rare yeah definitely and so that's really when you think well what have i got here and it was then that you know you start kind of putting together what well, the vague ideas of a book but what really did it was finding out that his nephew was still alive mm -hmm. and also people who remembered him living in north wales who'd met him you know when they were young so actually having you know testimony you know from family and and, and, and friends and you know people who are in their autumn years you know they were all in their 90s then but their long-term memories were crystal clear and they were really able, you know, they, they were able to bring him to life. And that's what really, you know, that's what changed it for me. That's what, that's what meant, you know, you had to go away and write a book. Yeah. So. Just on, on the history of Sunderland, I did a book on the teams of Sunderland DFC with uh, with a lad called Brian Ling, who's uh, big in the former Players Association, really nice lad, lives at Fulwell. And uh, we, we managed to find team photos of every single season from 1883 right the way up to when the book was published. Um, kindly got permission from Sunderland to produce some of the more recent ones. But on the theme of football being stopped uh, during the war, there's no pictures at all from something like 1916, 1917 and yeah, 1918, I think they were. Yeah. And they're, they're the only period in Sunderland's history other than the first three or four years when couldn't know as if there was even cameras or whatever. And that's but, what uh, that speaks volumes, the fact they're not yes, there, doesn't they're not it? There, that tells, you never, tells it all. Yeah, never never found. I think it was 15, 16, 17, 18, something like that. It was never be interesting never to taken. know who would have even been in those pictures, even if they were taken, considering so many people were away fighting. The, yes, there were. Some that did play, play games, not many. And then after, of course, 1918, there was what was called a victory league mm -hmm. was yeah. formed where it was just a local league where it was to get everybody back in the swing of things before mm -hmm. league football, really. And Sunderland played the likes of Newcastle and Hartlepool and uh, Darlington. And, yeah. and, and, yeah. and, but I, I think that was just to, to get back into the swing of things. But uh, yeah. The crazy thing about the Somme is that, you know, James, you know, you say, you know, you studied, you know, the first couple of days or the opening, mm. you know, days of it. The amazing thing is that it went on and on and on. Oh, yeah, it didn't June stop. turned to yeah. July. Lee ended up going out in July. He was sent over and he started fighting it in July. Mm -hmm. and then July turned to August and August turned to September. And September, by the end of September, what happens? The rains come. Mm. So you've got an already atrocious situation, you know, getting even, even, even worse. And, uh, I mean, I went out there as part of my research out to the summer. I, I found the spot where Lee fell. Mm-hmm. And I'd heard, you know, you read these accounts of kind of bodies falling and sinking into the mud. And you think, really? Can a body really sink into the mud? And when I was out there, I was out there in June and it had rained a couple of days beforehand. And I walked across the field where Lee died. Mm -hmm. And yeah, even, in, Ju even in June, it is possible. You know, the mud comes up and over your ankle. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't stop it. 
They just kept on going, kept on going both sides for very little territorial gain. That, that was one of the uh, the caveats to, to me writing my dissertation, not to bore you with too much academic uh, <laughs> nonsense, but the reason I wanted to write it um, was because, in my opinion, millions of working class men died at the behest of a European interrelated aristocracy for, for very little point. On both sides. On both sides. And the German and British frontline soldiers had more in common with each other than they did the people who were sending them yep. to fight, which is uh, which is tragic. And my the dissertation um, it focused on reactions towards death, so desensitisation, yeah. um, shock, anger, um, even pleasure. Yeah. And just thinking there, obviously we've got no evidence to back this up, but amongst all of that, having a character like Lee Roos there, well, with, he, with all of his extra, uh, you know, his his ways might have. Might the interesting have thing, it did. I, I think. The powers that be out there did see Lee as a bit of a kind of, you know, a, a, a kettle. You like know, a class could, joker type. Yeah, who could basically release the pressure a little bit. I mean, as well as fighting, I mean, what he, he did actually give talks, mm. you know, um, away from the front because, of course, they didn't just stand in the in the trenches all the time. You were allowed every now and then you could go back, fall back and have a bit of a break. Yeah. And Lee did talks to groups of men, you know, about his career mm. and, um, you know, uh, well, some pretty off the record stuff about Maori Lloyd and things like that, <laughs> I think, as well. Well, so. well, yeah, let, let's remember as well, talking about camaraderie during the First World War and footballers, remember if you go to Tynecastle, the home of Hearts, behind one of the ends there's a memorial to the Hearts Battalion mm. who, who went out en masse, yeah. joined up, you know, mm. your country needs you in a way they went and of course there was the Middlesex Regiment as well, there was two or three football clubs, I think it was Clapton Orient as well, had yeah. a few went out, so the... Like the pals kind of yes, thing. Yes, they, they did. The, the, the footballers kind of clubbed together and yeah, there was the camaraderie regiments. and yes, and, and they all went out together and uh, I remember Payne Prophet, who's the, the football artist too, I know did a did a quite beautiful piece on uh, on Clapton Orient on the First World War, lest we forget uh, the paint he did, which was an absolute beauty. But, but yes, there was this camaraderie between the footballers and yes, there were footballers' battalions. This was part of the problem. Uh, also, when it came to were trying to find out while I was doing my search, trying to find out exactly how Lee uh, died, because mm. a lot of people made a lot of assumptions about him. I think a lot of people jumped to the conclusion that he joined a sports battalion, yeah, um, because purely because he was a sportsman. Other people thought, well, um, he joined the uh, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Yeah, nope, it was the Royal Fusiliers. And, and, and back in these so, days, as well, the, his, the nature of studying history has changed so much as well. I'll, I'll add for the listener, back in these days, these kind of myths or assumed facts were allowed to continue because it wasn't easy to check. You've got the internet these days and you can go on newspapers. It's so easy to check now and fact check. Back then, you couldn't really do it. Could you, you couldn't do it. But mind you, we've got too much information now. I mean, I've seen stuff <laughs> on the internet. You know, you know, we all take the internet as gospel, actually. Mm. You know, it's, yeah. you should properly do your, you know, your research. You <laughs> yeah, well, shouldn't you, Paul? <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're going to talk in a future yeah. podcast about the founding of Sunderland Football Club, yes, yes, which we we've just touched on here because it goes to the heart of the founding of Sunderland Football Club mm. and this October 1879 v September 1880 date. Yeah. And we're, we're going to come on that, but yes, you raise a really, really good point. Mm. And it's only recently through the power of the internet and yeah. search engines that we've been able to nail some of these things mm. down. And, and being able to communicate with the with the likes of, of historians and, and authors and stuff like that wasn't as easy as it is now. No. No, no one really knew what had happened to Lee. It was, I mean, a, that was a, a mystery was, for ninety years, wasn't it? Until yeah, the, pretty until much. You yeah, it. pretty much until yeah, it just you know, you start putting the pieces together, and a lot of it even then. I mean, I, I wouldn't pretend to kind of have the the right version of events on a lot of what happened with Lee. But all you can do is document what you've been told and what was written down at the time, going through newspapers yeah, and things yeah. like that. But but for the the listener. The, the the bare bones that that I'm sure you'll now tell us about. I mean, his family thought he died in 1915 at Gallipoli, mm. and it turns out he died yeah. in 1916 at the Somme. At the Somme, and yeah. it's quite interesting. Well, it's, it's, oh, it's 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 amazing. Basically, after the war had finished, so a couple of years after the war had finished, you know, and by then life is if it can go back to normal you know you're starting to kind of get on with you know the football seasons are, are coming back and rugby returns and lee's brother-in-law was a, a welsh rugby uh, international and um so his brother-in-law and uh, lee's sister were at twickenham uh, for a wales versus uh, england international and afterwards they were having dinner in one of the committee rooms around a big big table and um, one of the guys who was there, oh, his name escapes me, was a um, 
Oh, he was a cartoonist. Drew cartoons for the Times. I've gone blank. I'll, I'll remember it as soon as, <laughs> as soon as I come off air, I'll remember his name. Anyway, basically, they were all talking, this whole table, everyone around the table was talking about, wasn't it a shame about what had happened to Lee Roos at, at uh, Gallipoli? And this uh, this guy, he said, well, no, hang on a minute. Lee Roos didn't die at Gallipoli. I played cricket with him after the evacuation in Cairo. <laughs> and so, you know, that came as a real bombshell to the to the family. They were like, you know, are you sure? He's like, yeah, he got out of Gallipoli. You know, I saw him in Cairo and, and there. And, of course, that you know, opens up a whole can of worms because you think, well, what happened to him then? You know, was he, was he, did he maybe uh, die on a boat coming back, which was torpedoed? Did, did he not write or, to his family after Gallipoli? He did, but the letters, well, this is the, this is the thing. I mean, they, they thought maybe he lost his mind and maybe he'd gone into some kind of like, you know, convalescence home or something. Some letters were sent back to London, but unbeknown to Lee, while he'd been away, because he didn't go back to, to, to London uh, for, for, you know, a long, long time. Unbeknown to him, his sister and her family had left London and had been evacuated. And some, you know, it's all very easy now. I mean, you're right, Paul. You think, well, surely they must mm. have, you know, a letter must have gone there, a letter must have gone there, or this must have happened. They must have put two and two together. I think in the middle of a war, when, yeah. you know... Um, uh, every street has got people who, you know, by the week are, are dying or being injured. You know, more, more post that has ever been sent any time, yeah, in any period of history as well. Yeah, it's going missing. Is on ships that are sinking. Is is in you know things that are being blown up. And basically, um, some letters did go back to people like George Holly. Holly right. still got mail from him. Uh, there's one. Le- there's one letter basically in which um, Lee writes to George Holly and describes uh, Gallipoli about how awful it was during the day with the intense heat and the flies and there was no cover at Gallipoli. And yet at night when the guns semi-stopped, he said, when you laid back and you looked up in the sky at the stars, because of course there were no clouds, you know, it's just like this most beautiful sky. Um, he just said, you know, it, it was just kind of, you know, almost utopia. You'd look up and there'd be these, you know, shooting stars going across the sky and stuff like that. And he wrote. He wrote to George, and yeah, that was one of his letters. I'll have to try and dig that. Up. I mean, that was years I'll ago. I'll have to see that one, Spencer. We'll have to I'll track have to that one down again. George that was Holly's definitely Holly's daughter or granddaughter, right. who may be alive, may not be alive now. I'm not sure, but she uncovered that for me. So right. yeah, yeah, incredible. But, but of course, at, at the time, I mean, another another just to throw it in. It, although Roos was, you know, arguably unarguably the biggest star of the day, there was also Billy Meredith, wasn't there, at Manchester yeah. City? Well, yeah, Billy and Lee were staying. big mates, yeah, yeah Welsh internationals yes. and everything as well. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, both of them were huge stars in, in, in those days. Meredith, of course, went on to Manchester United as well, but I think his, his career was probably better at Manchester City than there. Uh, yeah, and was in some United. kind of scandal, wasn't he, as well? Yeah. About, uh, it was a it was a Matt Fixon scandal, I believe. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. it was. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Although he seems to have come away, you know, pretty much untainted by that. He was involved in it, but I think the sheer fact that he was able to carry on playing for as long as he did. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it all came out until after his playing career, did it? You might be right I, about I can't that, remember actually. the exact story, but I do know that's maybe what, something, something will bring you on another show, try and get back to some Meredith, I, I'll have a word with a Manchester United fan about but, it. But yeah, Billy and, and Lee were the first kind of proper Welsh football heroes mm. soccer as they call it in Wales because of course football is mm. rugby football and then Buchan would come along later yeah because mm. Buchan's career of course went up to 1930 uh, odd and he left Sunderland in 1925 mm-hmm. cried when he left Sunderland yeah didn't want to go and then uh, carried on writing as a as a journalist yes. well, could, well either the story of Buchan's like a boy's own I mean yeah. I've, on Ryle football website I've got an account of his not just his life but his death Mm. And his death was as bizarre and as uh, as monumental as some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, you know things that, that went on in his life. But uh, yeah, he's in gold as green in London. God's finger touched him and he slept. Is his epitaph? Is it? Yes, I. It's anyway, in remembrance. Talking of death, I've just realised uh, I've got. We went around in circles there, weren't we? We were talking about you know the story of Lee and how we got to the you know how Lee had died. I mean, yeah, 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 that was it. We thought he died. Or his family thought he had died at um, at Gallipoli. They had no idea, although they had suspicions that he had got out and joined up and thought and gone somewhere else. But they didn't. They were only suspicions. They 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 didn't know. Uh, and the reason for that is that basically, when Lee joined the Royal Fusiliers, his surname appears to have been misspelt by a recruitment officer. So um, rather than R W O S E which was his accurate spelling of his surname, 
when he joined up, it went down the records as R-O-U-S-E. So when his family came to try and track down what had happened to him, of course, they were looking for R-O-O-S-E, but nobody, you know, with that name existed in the records anymore. And of course, why would you think to look under Rouse? You know, because it's a completely different name. Yeah, yeah. So they were banging their heads against a brick wall. And I mean, um, Lee's sister, Helena, um, I mean, pretty much dedicated the rest of her life to trying to find out what had happened to his brother. Um, and she died without knowing. But yeah. Helena's only son was the nephew who I was able to speak to at the end of his life. So he died knowing yeah. what had happened in the end. And that, to me, was pretty important, really. That was a major yeah. bit of the yeah, book, you know, the fact that he's... But the war office, see, well, the... the well, they had so whatever. No, they, of defense. But or... but again, you know, it's if they had contacts. You know, they're well known people. I mean, um, uh, and and basically they they put feelers out. But of course, everyone was looking for Lee Roos, Lee Roos yeah. and you know, not Lee Rouse. It was, uh, it, was, it was like he did. You know, and actually, he won the military medal. But even his name, when he was commended for the, for the military medal, was Rouse. It was still listed as that, and never got changed. But it of course, was, it, it was literally a case of him just missing the top off. And, yeah, off and all wasn't it's, it? It, it was it's, that it's, simple. It's, it's, I've seen the card that it's written down on, uh, which is in the, in Q in the National Archive down in Q, and it's it's R O, and then the O. Yeah, as you say, James, uh, on the second O, it doesn't quite join up. Mm. So there's a gap at the top. The, the, this this sort of thing, historical anomalies and whatnot, yeah. again. Just setting the scene here for the club's founding. Mm. We're, we're going to come across this straight <laughs> yeah. away, you know. We, we know, we know about just to touch on it. We know why mm. it went down as October eighteen seventy nine. Yeah, but we, we 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 actually know why it's not. Yeah, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and it's very similar historical kind of anomalies here that happens. Just one person happens to pick up something wrong yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And it just changes and the whole course of history. It's hard un- unraveling that type of history when stuff is being built on yes. something that's wrong. And it's also difficult to actually get the truth changed. I mean, yes, I, for, well, for, yeah. for several years, yeah, well, for, for several years, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I realised pretty much uh, early on that Lee Roos and Lee Rouse was exactly the same person. Mm-hmm. But going back to um, the powers that be at the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, you know, who rightly have a very big legacy, you know, to yeah. deal with. You know, they can't just go in and just change things just on the, you know, the say so of a, a sports writer like me. But there was so much evidence that basically, you know, this was a a, a muck up, mm-hmm. and the name really needed to be changed because because Lee's commemorated now because he's one of the missing of the the Somme. He's commemorated on on a colossal memorial out in uh, in France, in northern France, in the Somme region to the the missing of that battle which is uh, at a place called Thiepval. Yep. You know, some people may have heard of it, may even have visited it. If you haven't, go mm. because it'll change your life. It's 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 the, you know, your senses are just, you know, overwhelmed. Yeah. And Lee's name was on there, but he was listed as Lee Rouse. And for ages I was trying to get them to change it to Roos. And would they? No. Mm. You know, it was like we were producing letters. Other people I knew were writing, you know, letters, you know, uh, historians of the game in Wales, you know, mm-hmm. were writing mm-hmm. letters and they just wouldn't do it. And in the end, first of all, they, they changed. They they agreed in the end that, OK, well, we think, yeah, they're one and the same. Um, they were a bit naughty, actually, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. What they did was they changed it uh, overnight ele- on the electronic records. Mm-hmm. So if you went on electronically on the website, suddenly it was changed. Yeah. Didn't tell us. And they knew it for years we've been trying to get it done. It was almost like an admission of, okay, we may have got this wrong. Try to do it the Everyone door. gets things wrong, but at least just say you've changed it. So they did. I had a phone call one night. It's like, do you know it's changed? So, mm-hmm. Really? Went on, bingo, there it was. But it still took them another several years for them to change the actual, you know, the engraving. Yeah, the engraving to send a, a man up a, le- uh, up a ladder in mm. front and just round off that, turn that U into an O. Yeah. And that was done year before last. 19, well, uh, not 1916. Uh, you see, this is this is so. It is finally, finally, finally Lee, Lee Rouse has become Lee Roos, and finally, it's uh, that was almost like the end of the story to me. Yeah, that that, was like it's the yeah the recognition of, of home, who he was, where really. he was. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the, there's there is a there is a direct correlation. It's okay finding out the evidence and whatnot. 
but then changing people's opinions for things that have been going for a hundred and odd years, etc., that are all over flags, or you've got, you yeah, know, commercial <laughs> things that... Well, people think they're right, it. don't they? You know, people think, you know, it's like, nope, this is the history, this is the truth, and that's that. And if, you can come along and say, look, you if know... If they don't want to believe, then they won't believe, ultimately. Well, it, may, it, can, it can make them look silly, can't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll create a problem more in a few years' time. So. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Let's it's just something. keep on creating yes. problems, it's folks. It's something that's, that's going to have to be here. <laughs> no, it's, you know, it's it's for me a big thing about me is you know I'm, I mean I was talking to James about this beforehand. I mean I'm far more interested in in football and you know eras gone by and decades gone by mm. than I am in the modern game. You know, honestly, you know I, I really really am. There's very little in the modern game that really floats my boat so much now compared to you know all of these these amazing characters of it, it was, a, gone it was by. a different time we, we were it talking is. beforehand about Rish Carter coming across to Roker Park on the ferry yeah because yes. obviously Carter's a Hendon lad I live in Hendon and it annoys me when I come to this university yeah. and I have to go all the way around Carter would be over in, in five minutes yeah. across the water but it's putting things right you know that's that's my thing you know I see my role you know not as a you know as a, as a as a writer and an author as just you know making sure you're you're historically accurate and yeah. telling if you're going to tell the story tell the right one well and that, get it right you 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 you're right and in, in, in the i mean there's not many Sunday historians there's very few of us yeah, you yeah. know but those that are are pretty dedicated mm-hmm. to what they do i mean there's i can talk for myself i mean i'm at this virtually every night mm. i'm doing something you know yeah. Whether it's just looking back and recapping on stuff, or looking through the echoes archives, or looking at pictures and doing something with prints and all this sort of thing, so I, I do feel, particularly for a club like Sunderland, that uh, I don't know whether too many Sunderland fans think about it. I think they do. History is a big thing mm. to Sunderland fans. For if me, it it's wasn't, all we've got at the moment. <laughs> yes, if it wasn't, you, you know, it, it wouldn't be the club. It, it what it is, and it wouldn't get the support it does. Mm. I think a lot of things. I don't know whether it's past glories drives people on to what could be or there's just something within it but I could tell you one or two great stories about people who aren't Sunderland supporters and when they found out I'm a Sunderland supporter of the older generation mm. absolutely wax lyrical about Sunderland you know mm. stood there and almost bigged them up as much as <laughs> as me like you know yeah, yeah. I tell you it, what uh, was really interesting during the research for the Lee book is that you know you're, you're going back a long long time now but you know you're almost going back to the evolution of the game you know I'm, I'm reading about clubs like uh, like you know is, is, you know Stoke City and some of the other clubs he played for which still then were quite quite in an embryonic stage almost you know getting crowds of kind of four or five thousand six thousand a lot more when Lee joined the amazing thing about Sunderland and this part of the world and I've got to take you know Newcastle as well is the strength and depth of the passion that already existed Mm. at that early relatively early days of the game of association football Mm. in this area I mean when the two clubs played each other you know you're talking you know already crowds of 50 60 thousand you know which was just almost unheard of anywhere else in in the country and that really as somebody who isn't from this part of the world but's always admired football and what it means to to the northeast that really brought it home to me you know the Mm. fact that yeah you know you you were here first. I, th- I think our um, our record attendance at Roker Park was seventy five thousand against Derby quarter final. Eighteen, yeah. In the qu- quarter final of the um, FA Cup, I think it was Rish Carter's first season, nineteen thirty three, and they actually had it was a midweek game on a Wednesday, and they said the the um, the queues at the uh, the unemployment office so people could get the the, <laughs> yeah. the the wages in the morning to go to the match, yeah, while the door the shipyards had to close because everyone wanted to go to the football. It was, well, well, I've got a grainy picture of the game. And the sun and goalie kicking the ball upfield, and you can make out the supporters all around. For those who remember Roker Park and who were there, the supporters were sitting on the cinder track of the outside, uh, almost, <laughs> almost, almost right the way up to the white lines. Yeah. How they took a throw in and what, I'm not quite sure. But uh, well, Car- Carter comments saying he, he he thinks that the match should have been cancelled, but they didn't because it would have caused an absolute that would have riot. caused a, you know, an even bigger fuss. I mean, <laughs> so we all, you know we a lot of us you know you remember uh, or you don't remember, but you've seen pictures of the first ever FA Cup final at Wembley. Yeah. You know, the white horse, the white final, horse you know, with that horse, you know, the policeman on the horse trying to keep order. Which the ideals have kind of laid the yeah. foundations for what is Britishness. Really? Yeah. Is this true? Well, this is this true. A guy, um, one of me, Martin Johns, again, to mention and wrote about it, uh, the white horse final. It kind of sets a precedent about the ideals of 
kind of the working class being orderly. This is at a time of, of revolution in, in different yeah. places and the working class is rebelling. Yeah. But in Britain, one white horse was able to, <laughs> to to keep opposing fans apart. But that's almost gone down in history as kind of almost like the moment where, uh, you know, huge crowds, you know, started going to football. It's yeah. almost like that's the lazy way of looking at it. It's, oh, look, you know, 150,000 possibly people, possibly more trying to get into Wembley. Mm-hmm. You know, that's almost the moment where, you know, football, you know, really became a, a mass kind of, you know, well, remember, sport. But of course, these crowds were already up here. Well, uh, yes. You know, 10, 15, were, 20 years But before. remember as well, we're talking about the 1923 Cup final as being, you know, perhaps maybe a, a, a start of something or whatever. But remember the 1913 FA Cup final, which had been played at the Crystal Palace between Sunderland and Aston Villa, yeah. who were genuinely one and two in the league. Yeah. That attracted a world record crowd of 121,919 yeah. people. And then Can now, you imagine that? But talk, the crush would be talking crazy. of, you know, slightly people rewriting history and facts getting changed, of course, you know, when Wembley came into being in the 20s, of course, it was in the Football Association's interest to publicise all things Wembley. Yeah. So it's almost become, you know, in the same way now that it's almost like, oh, you know, Premier League records yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, we ignore records that were set in the 60s, 70s and 80s. It's the same way almost to ignore crowds and attendances and Good matches word, that did. happened pre-Wembley at Crystal Palace. Well, of course, Tottenham. Tottenham's a recent case in point, isn't it? I mean, they're now playing at Wembley, mm. getting these crowds. But the highest ever crowd was at White Hart Lane against Sunderland. Yeah. You know? Seventy five thousand and thirty eight, I think it was. Which is crazy if you if you look at how big White Hart Lane is. Just to bring it back to Lee Bruce, though, he must yeah. have been. He was extremely highly thought of on Wearside. Um, when he left, a testimonial was arranged in his honour, which, according to the Sunderland Echo, was highly oversubscribed and raised about forty pound for Bruce, which was about four and a half grand in today's money. Yeah, most of that money, I think, he gave back. Did he? Actually, yeah, I think I think you know he was he was he was you know comfortable and he made you yeah, know yeah. he did well off his boot money and things like that. And I know. I know when he did finish at Sunderland around about that time, I know there was one match. I think there were strikes on in this part of the world around about that time where basically it was, you know, uh, uh, fans knowing that he was an amateur Mm -hmm. tried to give him money as a a thank you, thinking that, you know, he was just playing for the love of the game, not really realising the size of his expenses. (laughs) And he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't even take any of that or anything. So Yeah, well, it's interesting with testimonials back then. I mean, nowadays, if you have a testimonial, like Quinn had one against the Republic of Ireland. But back then, they didn't have a separate game. What they did was they said, oh, by the way, next week's game against Huddersfield Town on Newcastle United, Mm. it is Tommy Tate's benefit or it's Lee Richmond Roos. So it wasn't an actual separate game. It was a game that they designated the club Mm -hmm. as whatever money they got, minus their expenses, I assume. Yeah. He got the money. I've got to say, with with Lee, he wasn't even granted a testimonial because the FA wouldn't allow, you know, because he was an amateur, the FA said no. He's not allowed a testimonial. So what actually happened was that's why fans tried to give him him money. money. He got the address. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, he was given this fabulous kind of, you know, this this address, this big book, you know, of of of, it's lovely. It's like the it's like the bio tapestry and the cheering shroud all in one, you know, fancy pictures and, and, and ink work and stuff, and that still survives today that's in lee's family today which is a remarkable piece of work Mm. and he was given that and uh they all went out for dinner rather than a testimonial dinner everyone went out for dinner directors players whatever and i think it was at the end of that um which was when he was retiring i think he had a testimonial one then when he retired well when he was bowing out from sunderland after he broke his arm and he promised to uh at the end of that dinner he promised to return and irritate every one of you (laughs) in the future and um he did he came back up here the season after he'd broken his arm and his, his arm did repair, but he wasn't quite the goalkeeper that he was beforehand. But he joined Arsenal and he came back up to, to Wearside one last time. It was in 1912, I think. Yeah, 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 the 1911-1912 season. And um, yeah, Arsenal, Sunderland won one nil. But apparently the ovation, you know, it was reading the reports, you know, in old newspapers of the ovation he got when he came back was quite something. I, I wonder if he ever met Sunderland's founder who was, of course, a Scotsman called James Allen because mm. James Allen didn't die until 1911. No, I, I've met James Allen's um, living relatives actually. Right. Very nice people. Right. Because um, they were completely unaware of who James Allen was until Is that right? Until about 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, Allen, Allen didn't die till 1911 so he would have been around the same time but once Allen leaves Sunderland <coughs> we kind of lose track of him as regards football and whether 
and of course he fell out with Sunderland Football Club he and Sunderland Albion but that's that's another day but that shows you the kind of era we're talking about yeah. the actual founder of Sunderland was alive yeah. when, when, when Roos was, was around, around the town a lot of people ask me it was like well how come supporters of the clubs that he played for didn't try and look into what had happened to Lee after yeah. World War One. you know why didn't they ask questions why didn't they do my, a lot of them did but of course what you've also got to remember is that first of all, you know, no one, you, you know, you had to know that Lee was missing first and there was this confusion about, you know, his name and what had happened. Yeah. But the other thing, of course, is why would you miss a goalkeeper who you'd admired from afar when, of course, your dad wasn't coming back mm, or yeah, your uncle course. wasn't coming back or your brother or your brothers. You and know, everybody was affected. Yeah, we forget anything. that, you know, the, the devastation, the personal devastation within families that World War One, co- you know, caused. Mm. So, of course, you know, that's, yeah, that's possibly why, you know... Well, yeah, there was there was a lad to score the winning goal for Aston Villa in the nineteen thirteen FA Cup final, Tommy Barber, who ironically was from Newcastle, mm-hmm. and it was always said that he went to the First World War and died. He was he was gassed, mm-hmm. mustard gas, mm-hmm. and he died. But he actually didn't. He came back and he ended up playing for something like Shrewsbury Town or something. <laughs> but he, he didn't last very long after the First World War. And he and he did pass away in sort yeah. of sixteen yeah. or seventeen. Yeah. But yes, the fog of war. Produces all these and not historical anomalies it's, and but the confusion of the yes, time. Yeah, it's no one's fault. Yeah, I don't no. think you know. There's no malice in it. I mean, uh, James, you know, you were saying that you know maybe there was some kind of confusion about Lee because he was on the run from something, but, yeah, trying to hide, like, you know, out, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> bills, you know, outdated bills, or they're all, or, they're all the rumors tend to yeah. Tend to circle. It's like therefore, yeah. basically, he maybe had you know one or two you know children mm. out of wedlock and people were chasing him for maintenance or something. All of this is you know, it's 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 boulder dash really all it was was basically it was a slightly misspelt you know yes, card right. when he joined up it, it, at the it, recruitment it, office it says something as well about the chaotic nature of the, the first world war that you know a hundred years later we're still unpiecing it yeah to a degree and there's still there's still stuff that we'll, but i we'll think there is i mean this is the great thing now as well you know about there's so much now about you know a hundred years on you know it's 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 i love this stuff i love yeah, the great. fact that we're remembering this yeah. you know the uh, 100 years since the mm. beginning of the first world war you know of course this year it'll be 100 years you know since the end well, yeah there's another um, yeah there's another historical anomaly the one about the, the hemi painting yes of course yeah, people yeah. say that the reason they've all got the fist clenched is because thomas hemi used to paint pugilist boxes yeah he used to do boxes he never yeah. did yeah i, I know that the thomas hemi a historian a lad called peter Searle, and uh, there's not not any evidence whatsoever yeah. of Hemi painting pugilists at all. He was a he, his family were maritime yeah. painters more than anything. Although he did paint three or four beautiful football pictures, of, of course, of which I didn't know that. Yes, of the, which, the, the Hemi painting for those that don't know is the big um, painting Sunderland v Aston Villa that hangs in the um, the club reception. It's beautiful. I've beautiful seen piece. that. I've seen that picture. Yeah, obviously uh, I've seen got, that. I didn't know the history about it. Yeah, it's got oh. two titles: a corner kick or. Uh, now or never, it's called. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's supposed to be the oldest uh, paint of an association football match anywhere in the world, and uh, there's a brilliant story about that as well. well we can go to that with the title. Great story. There's, um, there's a, a guy called Martin Cook who um, who had a, a similar thing with a foundation formation. He actually managed to prove it to Stoke, and Stoke now recognise both. So, and, and the, of course, the, the William Webb Ellis thing with with rugby. Yep. That for years was taken as gospel that Will, William Webb Ellis invented rugby because he picked up the ball and. Stoke started running um it's it's an absolute myth there's there's no it's not rooted in any sort of history at all it's a shame really when historical fact gets in the way of some of these brilliant stories <laughs> but, it's, but that's the way it is we might as well have it right you know? legend is just rumor plus time yes i like that very good billy yeah. Connolly, i've got to yeah. say who didn't play for sunderland football club but he uh, yeah, yeah. he's a favorite of mine he should have done comedian ha uh, After this season, they that, could do uh, with him, couldn't they? Uh, but we could do with anybody at the moment. Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll go between the two of you for a final couple of sentences on, on Lee, just to, to what he means to you. I'll start with oh, you, Spencer. Impossible. Uh, two sentences. Three, no, it's, four. It's, it's, been, it's been years of my life piecing together this man's life, and it, it, it's just been an absolute honour. And mm. to kind of get to the truth, well, no, to get to the truth, yeah. to find out where he died, what happened to him, and meet his family now, is, yeah, it, it's been an honour. It might be impressive work, if you don't mind me saying. Thank from, you. From, from a historian as well. Thank you, yeah. Lost in France, folks. It's yes, good, of course, the, the, book, gonna, the yeah. book is available. Please plug it. Yeah, lot, yeah Lost yeah. in France by me, Spencer Vignes, and it's available through Pitch Publishing. So, yeah. Fantastic. Paul Lee Roosner, a couple of sentences. Yeah, I think the two facts for Sunderland fans and why we should remember him is one, he replaced really de facto, the even though it was just for 90-odd games, the iconic 
mm-hmm. Ned Doig. That was uh, that was one thing. And of course, every one of the eleven players who was a member of the nine one team. Yeah, uh, deserves to be remembered in perpetuity. <laughs> Thanks for the fans, yeah. which which remains our biggest victory and their biggest defeat. So, still does, doesn't it? That's the biggest does. top flight away victory still. Yep. And what publications do you have out to uh, to purchase them? Up? Well, uh, the, the most of them are, are out on eBay and whatnot. There's yeah. one or two on the on the website. And January's my month for deciding which ones I'm going to be bringing out this year and what I'm Good. going to be writing about. So I'll be talking to Mark Metcalf about that. Yes, and we'll hope to get Mark one or on two things. So, uh, so I'm hoping by the end of January I've decided in my own mind what I'm doing and I'll crack on with this year's uh, projects. Brilliant. Well, thank you both for uh, for joining us and Spencer especially for uh, travelling over. I know Paul came from Chesley Street as well. Not quite as far, but... Uh, slightly further. Oh, it's yeah, been yeah, a pleasure. Yeah. As I said, it's just great coming back. Love this part of the world. So, no, it's an honour. Thank Great, you. thank you both. Um, as usual, you can find us on Twitter at The Rogue Report or on Instagram these days um, and check out the podcast because hopefully we're going to have, have Paul back maybe even Spencer one day. Yeah, if the I'll right, be uh, Buy me a cup of tea, I'll go in. If the right subject uh, comes. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Cheers.